the average the average scientist uh, is yeah probably fits a certain mold. I don't think I'm that typical. My background, I, I did a degree in marine chemistry, so I'm a, technically a scientist. I've got a BSc in marine chemistry, so that's an environmental slanted chemistry degree. And I've also got a PhD which was awarded from the Department of Chemical Engineering uh, in combustion science, so a completely different area uh, after I graduated. Uh, so uh, over the last um, 20 years almost I've been in engineering and so I'm, I've, I've picked up enough of engineering to, to, uh, to fake being an engineer but I'm also a, a chemist as well. I've got a brother who's a bit older than me, he's, a, he's, he's in the year ahead at school and I remember very clearly at the age of seven he announced to the family that he was going to be a doctor and uh, that's what he was you know, he's aiming for and uh, sure enough he is, he's a doctor now, he's a consultant in Birmingham. And uh, I remember thinking at the same time, I want to be a spy. Uh, so I had no real aspirations to go into any given career. And I never really have, if I'm honest. There was, um, I suppose there was a pivotal moment where I was given an English essay back. And the, uh, the guy that was marking it said, this was at school, uh, I don't know whether to give you an A or a D for this, this work. And I suddenly realised that if you go into arts, it's all very subjective and you can never assure that you know, you, you're going to get a good mark for what you do or get appreciated for what you do. And it's different in sciences. It's either right or wrong. So um, it's much more um, certain to go into sciences where you know, there are definites, there are rules and laws and so on. And, uh, and uh, it was an area that I enjoyed uh, quite a lot of school. I've got a lot to thank my chemistry teacher for. She taught me from the age of 11 to 18, uh, the same teacher all the way through school. And uh, so I think she influenced my eventual choice at university. In the 80s when I was at school, we had a careers advisor and she wasn't particularly good at her job, I don't think, but uh, you'd explain the things that you like and what you want to do as a job, and then she'd tell you to become an accountant. Because in the 80s, you know, in the uh, 1987, 88, accountancy was a big thing, and everyone, they all drove Porsches, and there was a big boom uh, time. And uh, so we just ignored her and went and did her own thing. But essentially, I, I wanted to do chemistry, and I looked at the statistics of, you know, how many chemistry graduates are there every year. And, you know, if you really want to go somewhere and do something interesting, then you'd have to be in the top flight, you'd have to get a good result from a good university, otherwise you know, you're competing with hundreds and hundreds of other graduates, uh, thousands even. So uh, my other interest was into the environment uh, to some extent, and uh, so marine chemistry was a natural uh, sort of variation of just a straight chemistry degree, so that's why I, I chose that subject. And I was into diving as well, I did a lot of subaqua at, at the time, so I thought well, that's a good way of combining it all and uh, started looking for universities that taught that course. Um, ah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I graduated from, uh, from Bangor and uh, I found out there's only actually one, one university that taught that course. There were three other universities that taught variations of it, but I ended up going there. Um, I went there with my girlfriend from school. Uh, we got engaged whilst we were there and uh, she got a job back in Nottingham um, as an accountant and I thought well, it's probably a good idea to follow her back to Nottingham otherwise it could be awkward and so I looked for a PhD in the University of Nottingham and uh, that's why I, I sort of started to look broad, more broadly across different subjects. It's because of a girl. Yeah, my chemistry teacher at school, remember when we said we were going to the same university, she said it will never work out. So uh, we've been married 18 years, we've got five kids so uh, it's, uh, it's going quite well I think. Academics, are, it's an interesting uh, job because uh, a lot of people don't really understand what academics do. Um, and so uh, it's not like being a teacher where you, you, know, you teach and uh, you, know, you have long holidays and it's always uh, one of these areas that people will think about. You know, teachers have huge holidays in the summer and so on. Um, Academics aren't quite the same because uh, when the teaching stops, because we do teach undergraduate courses and uh, master's courses, when those um, semesters finish, then we have a lot more time for research. So the, one of the other fundamental parts of an academic's position is uh, doing research into areas that are of 
you know, industrial or commercial significance or scientific importance? Well, originally, um, my PhD was in coal combustion. And uh, that's what I came back to do. I did a PhD in coal combustion. And um, the underlying theme of all my research is image analysis, because I used image analysis to solve a problem in my, you know, my PhD. And from there, I've used that as a, as a backdrop for all the science and engineering things that I've looked at. And uh, from there, I went on to look at fluid mixing and fluid dynamics and uh, reactor design. And I designed a reactor, which is uh, now a fundamental part of a company that uh, exists called Promethean Particles. The best part of my job is, uh, is giving a great lecture or coming up with an idea in research and finding out that it works or you know, making some, some breakthrough. Um, the worst part of my job, I think, is probably rather tedious admin um, or being told that your latest grant application has been turned down, which happens to most academics most of the time these days. That is nothing worse than spending months and months preparing something which you think is a really good idea, is really well written and so on, and then some referee somewhere makes some comment that means that you don't get the funding. That's the worst feeling in the world. It's such a waste of time. Yeah, I think it's, it's fair to say if you look at all academics across the university, you will not get one answer as to what we're really doing here. Um, a lot of the uh, science uh, faculty are looking for breakthroughs, understanding a new, you know, a new area of science. Uh, I work in engineering and one of the, the, you know, one of the most significant things for us would be to see something that we've developed in application, in industry, you know, either commercially successful or it's just, you know, it's gone straight into industry, it's doing something important and you can say, I did that. There's nothing more satisfying, I think, for an engineer to have solved a problem and to see it being implemented. If you're solving problems that, you know, for questions and nobody's asking, then that's not really very successful, that's not really very useful. But if you, if you come up with a solution, you come up with an answer to something and then it gets implemented, that's fantastic. If anybody says to a chemical engineer, what is a chemical engineer, we, we all know that you have approximately 20 seconds. If you can't explain what you do in 20 seconds, nobody's really interested. OK, Ed, from now you've got 20 seconds. Uh, to, uh, to explain chemical engineering. OK, chemical engineers, they take raw materials and turn them into valuable products. There you go. Oh, that was seven seconds. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, the obvious example, crude oil into uh, petrol. During a research project, is we developed a new type of reactor. We were at a trade show as an, a, an academic poster, and there were loads of different companies around us asking questions, and we realised that nobody would take it seriously unless because the question was always uh, if it's so good why haven't you done something with it you know why why are you trying to sell it to us when when it, if it's that good you should be doing something yourself so we took a, a strategic decision to start a company a small company uh, that would use this technology and make materials for these larger companies that would be then uh, more interested in what we were doing so nanotechnology really is just any technology that involves small things. So nano means a billionth of a metre, so really small particles get integrated into all sorts of products all the time, uh, but you never really see them, obviously, because they're too small. And there's no nanotech industry for the general public, but they will buy toothpaste with nanoparticles in or sunscreen or, you know, even when you look like through a state... If you look through a stained glass window, uh, with all the colours, that's nanotechnology because there are nanoparticles of gold in the glass that give it the different uh, colours. But there's lots of new um, potential areas for development and uh, so our company manufactures nanoparticles for um, applications. So if a company wants to make a new electronic circuit, they might want nano copper or nano silver or something that can be deposited in a small uh, line. And we will optimise as a company the, the solution for them and then mass manufacture for that company. I like writing, so I've, I've written lots of scripts. Uh, one's been on telly actually as well, but uh, that's a different story. Um, uh, I um, run a Sunday school, which is really weird. I never thought in life I'd ever end up uh, doing that, but that's one thing I do. Um, I've got five kids, so I provide plenty of children for the Sunday school um, and uh, other things that I do. 
I'm licensed to bury people. 